In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance uh, family. And as always, uh, let's uh, start off our conversation by invoking Mary, the Mother of God. Mary has many titles. Mary is the Mother of God. Mary is the Mother of the Church. And Mary is the Mother of each and every one of us. We cry out to Mary also in that beautiful prayer that we say at the end of the rosary. It's called the Hail Holy Queen. We turn to Mary and ask for her blessings and her prayers as we say this Hail Mary. And she is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's turn to Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Let's now turn to the Holy Spirit, and he is our counselor. He's also known as the consoler. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete. And there I see the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is the bond of love between the Father and the Son. Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, and the mutual love between the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. And St. Paul reminds us that we don't know how to pray as we ought, but it's the Holy Spirit can help us intercede with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Abba, Father. So let's turn to the Holy Spirit and beg for a very special grace of the Holy Spirit. Give us a lot of light, a lot of peace, a lot of joy, and a lot of love as we sing this prayer to the Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, all afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, all afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Now on us. <clears throat> Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Fall afresh on us. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Teresa of Avila, pray for us. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
We welcome you all to our Perseverance family. But a year ago, I was listening to Relevant Radio, and I was listening to um, St. Joseph's workshop of Father Matthew Spencer. And he told this story I'd like to share with you as we start our conversation this morning. He said there was a convent of nuns, and uh, one of the nuns who wasn't known for her great holiness, just kind of an ordinary nun, she got sick and she died. Now, shortly after that, Jesus appeared to the Mother Superior. And the Mother Superior wanted to know where this nun was. Was she in purgatory? Was she saved or not? And Jesus said immediately, oh, that sister, she went right to heaven. Now, Mother Superior was taken aback because this nun did not seem to really radiate this aura of holiness in the convent. She didn't seem to be really a, a bad nun, but she didn't seem to be a very good nun either. And Jesus, talking with the Mother Superior, told her the reason why that she went right to heaven is that she she took advantage of what the church offers. <clears throat> so, by means of that story, I'd like to tell you in honor of St. Joseph because we are in the year of St. Joseph. The Holy Father is granting us a plenary indulgence using the following conditions, but also by carrying out certain practices in honor of St. Joseph. So here are the normal requirements to acquire an indulgence, and then I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the actions we can do in honor of St. Joseph to acquire a plenary indulgence. And the normal conditions of me of receiving a plenary indulgence, <clears throat> just so you're aware of what a plenary indulgence is, it's the forgiveness of sins as well as the temporal punishment due to the sins. That means your sins are forgiven, but also in a certain sense, the debts you would owe to God to repair for the sins, they're washed clean also. So first, you have, you have to make a good sacramental confession. A good sacramental confession. So prepare yourself. And it's also good, it's a good practice at the beginning of the new year. Go through the steps. And the steps would be examination of conscience, sorrow for sin, Firm purpose of amendment. Confess your sins to the priest, the number and the species. 
and carry out the penance. Once that is done, then you are forgiven of your sins. But let's move on to how we can receive this plenary indulgence. The next would be to go to Mass. As Vatican II points out, Sacrosanctum Concilium, you want to participate fully, consciously, and actively in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And of course, the, the culmination of the Mass would be the consecration of the Mass, but the communion also. You want to make a good sacramental communion and a good sacramental confession. And then, after that, to carry out some action. The Pope has given a, a whole list of things you can do in honor of St. Joseph. Pray the litany to St. Joseph. Offer your work to St. Joseph. Pray for the unemployed. All of this can be done very quickly. Then pray for the intentions of the Holy Father. And this is, this is key. Make a firm proposal to give up. To give up, reject all sin, both mortal sin and venial sin. That means also to avoid the near occasion of sin. The near occasion of sin could be a person, a place, a thing, <clears throat> and a circumstance. So I thought I would bring that to your attention on this uh, Friday, in the second week of Christmas, that all of us would be able, at the beginning of this new year, in honor of the birthday of Christ, In honor of good St. Joseph, be able to start with a new slate. Start a new life by receiving a plenary indulgence. And remember the story. The story of that convent of nuns and this nun who died didn't seem to be a very good nun. But Jesus said to Mother Superior, she took advantage of what the church offers. We'll be talking to you about this in the first reading, that the church, which is the mystical body of Christ, from his open heart pierced by the lance, comes gushing forth blood and water. There are treasures that the church offers to us, and we just have to accept these treasures. They are free of charge. It's as if you were to come into the church and there's a huge reservoir of diamonds, and you just have to go into the sacristy and grab them. These treasures are for us, and we simply have to receive them. But remember the conditions to receive the plenary indulgence. And if you receive the plenary indulgence and you die, you would go right to heaven. You wouldn't have to go to purgatory. So the conditions are good confession, mass and communion, one of those actions 
that the Pope has mentioned. There's others too, praying the rosary in your family or in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Praying for the intentions of the Pope and trying to avoid sin, as well as, as well as the near occasion of sin. And you got it. Then, the hope is that you can go to heaven right away. So let's go into the readings today. Over the past couple of weeks, The first reading has been taken from the first letter of St. John. The Gospel today we'll be reading through St. Luke. We see Jesus Christ in his compassion, love. We see Jesus as healer. Jesus is the divine physician. He wants to heal us. Our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our souls, our emotions. He wants to heal us. So my friends, let's, uh, let's delve into the first reading and we'll take a few ideas. St. John says, Beloved, who indeed is the victor over the world? but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. <clears throat> right, my friends. We are called to be saved. Our salvation comes from one person. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. We can only be saved by one person. And that person is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For that reason, the name that was given to him by the angel The name that was given to him by the angel, which is Jesus. That means God saves. So we should humbly beg the Lord to apply his name to us. And beg the Lord for our salvation. The salvation of our country, the salvation of our family, the salvation of our children. The next verse is a very key verse to our passage today. And it speaks about how Jesus came. This is the one who came through water and through blood. Jesus Christ, not by water alone, but by water and blood. <clears throat> okay, now if you look at this image here, this image here is the image of Divine Mercy. And you can see the heart of Christ. The heart of Christ is from within. And emanating from the heart of Christ is exactly that. You can see my hand is touching it, my finger. The lighter rays that are emanating from the heart of Christ is blood, is, is, is rather white ray would be water. Whereas right now I'm touching The red rays, and that's symbolic of blood. So both water and blood. Where do these come from? 
This actually comes from John chapter 19, Good Friday. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, and he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And the soldier beneath the cross took his lance and thrust his lance into the side of Christ. And that lance passed through the side of Christ and pierced his, it pierced his heart. And from his heart came gushing forth what you see right now the blood and the water. The blood and the water. So as St. John is mentioning today, it refers to this image of divine mercy. Jesus promised St. Saint Faustina that those who honor this image will receive many graces and blessings. We hope and we pray that all of you have this divine mercy image in your home in some prominent place. <clears throat> Below it says, Jesus, I trust in you. A couple months ago when I was visiting my mother in Florida, there's a very good man that picked me up at the airport. His name was Jack. And he served as sacristan for my mass. One occasion we were talking to sacristy and he, we were talking about this whole idea of divine mercy. And he said, Father, when I'm going through difficult times, When I'm going through real trials, when I have certain crosses, they seem to be very heavy. Said so I say, Jesus, I trust in you, I say it ten times. And he said, for the first three times, I don't really mean it. The next four times, I'm warming up. But then he went on to say that the last three times, the eighth, the ninth, and the ten, he said, I really mean it, and I beg the Lord for the grace to conform my will to your will. What he was saying that, very interesting for us, is the cross that God gives to us can be sometimes very heavy. can be very heavy. So it takes prayer and patience and time <clears throat> to be able to carry the cross that God gives to us. Prayer, time, and patience. Let's go back to the blood and water that St. John mentions. To contemplate this image, the water is symbolic of two sacraments. Sacraments of purification. And those sacraments would be that of baptism. In the sacrament of confession. The sacrament of baptism, the sacrament of confession is would be the light rays 
which are the water that gush forth from the heart of Christ. This Sunday we'll be celebrating the baptism of Jesus. Whenever we celebrate the baptism of Jesus, in a certain sense, we're calling to mind our own baptism. That washed away original sin from our souls. In the baptism which transformed us into sons of God, brothers to Jesus Christ, and friends of the Holy Spirit, in temples of the Blessed Trinity. But also the water is symbolic of another sacrament. It's symbolic of the sacrament of confession. So baptism washes away original sin. But then confession washes away our personal sin. Now look at the red rays. The red rays are the blood of Christ. When we participate in Holy Mass, We're in the state of grace. We receive these words, the body, the blood, the soul, the divinity of Jesus Christ. I repeat, we receive the body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us pray that we have a real hunger for God. Have a real hunger for God. A real hunger for God. As Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood will have everlasting life and I will raise him up on the last day. So I invite all of you to renew your, your gratitude for the sacraments because the blood and water that John is mentioning is symbolic of the fact of Christ was not a ghost, but Jesus Christ came. He assumed a human body. Human body has blood. But also, these are symbolic of sacraments. We should be thankful that we're able to receive the sacrament of baptism. But we should be thankful also for the fact that we are able to receive the Eucharist. If you can receive the Eucharist, receive the Eucharist as often as possible and worthily. If it's not possible, get in the habit of making what is called a spiritual communion. Spiritual communion, you can make any time, any place, using whatever words you want. Spiritual communion is a, an ardent desire to receive Christ into your heart spiritually. And that can be prayed in this way. Lord, I cannot receive you spiritually, or sacramentally rather, Come at least spiritually into the depths of my heart. 
I receive you with, with great faith, hope, and love. Grant me the grace to love you more and more each day. Before St. Thomas Aquinas died, yesterday we talked about St. Raymond of Penafort, who was a Dominican that lived at the same time as Thomas Aquinas. Their companions. <clears throat> and St. Raymond of Penafort encouraged Thomas Aquinas to keep writing the Summa Theologica. The end of his life, Thomas Aquinas is praying in front of the crucifix. And Jesus said, Thomas, Thomas, you've written very well. And he said, Thomas, what is the gift that you would like me to give to you? Thomas did not ask for money power, pleasure, long life, or fame. St. Thomas Aquinas begged for this grace. Lord, grant me the grace to love you more and more each day. I think as we meditate upon the water and the blood in this image, and the water and blood that St. John mentions, and the Spirit. There are many gifts that we can beg for. And the gift that we can pray for is to love God more and more. The last point I'd like to make before moving into the Gospel is this. St. John says that we will have a great gift. You will have this great gift. You will have eternal life St. <clears throat> John says you who believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful promise? You will have eternal life if you believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us cultivate a great love for the name of Jesus Christ. And say often, The, the divine praises. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his Precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be your holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be your glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, Virgin and Mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God and his angels and in the saints. So my friends, the message today, St. John in his first letter says that Jesus came in water and blood, not simply water, but in blood. And there are three things that give testimony, the water, the blood, and the spirit. 
then we have this beautiful, beautiful promise. God says to us in the letter of St. John, 1 John chapter 5, <clears throat> that we have eternal life. We have eternal life if we believe in the name of Jesus Christ. So let's pray that our belief, our faith in Jesus will never wane. But our belief and trust in Jesus will grow stronger and stronger each day. But our belief in Jesus Christ will also bring us to love him. That is to say, a faith that is infused by charity. That's the first reading today. The response or real psalm is taken from Psalm 147. And the antiphon is, Praise the Lord Jerusalem. Yesterday, we talked about how we can praise God. And the highest form in which we can praise God is through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, we have what, we have what is called the doxology. The doxology is when the priest lifts up the host and the chalice. And he can say or he can sing. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. So we are praising God the Father by the offering of God the Son, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you really want to praise God, the best way you can praise God is through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But today I'll add another way in which you can praise God. And that could be by praying the Psalms. Right now I'm mentioning Psalm 147. <clears throat> The Psalms. The Psalms would be the prayer book of the Bible. Most of these were composed by King David. And the Psalms express the basic sentiments of the human heart. They express the basic gamut of sentiments or emotions of the human heart. among which one of the most noble sentiments of the human heart is that of praising God. This Psalm 147, Psalm 148, 149, 150, the last three Psalms in the Psalter are Psalms of Praise. Many of you have gone through the spiritual exercises with me. And I'm going to be starting another program on January 30th, Saturday at 12 o'clock, a 10-week program, which will end on Easter, the Saturday before Easter. We invite you to come to it. It will be April 30th <clears throat> at 12 and Spanish 2.15.
In this spiritual exercise, we start off with the foundational principle, which is we are we are created, my friends. Why? We are created to praise God, reverence God, and to serve God, and by means of that, to save our souls. We are created to praise God, to reverence God, to serve God, and to save our souls. As Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? So that's one point I'd just like to highlight from the psalm. We can praise God the best way through the Mass. But also we praise God through the Liturgy of the Hours and through praying the Psalms. And you can praise God through what I just said, prayed, the divine praises. Blessed be God, blessed be his holy name, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. And as John says, we have eternal life, those who believe in the name of the Son of God. And that Son of God is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I hope all of you have an image of divine mercy. So when you're doing your meditation today, John speaks about Jesus came in blood and water. You might carry out your meditation in front of this divine mercy image. Blood, water, and the Holy Spirit. Beg the Holy Spirit to help you. My friends, now we arrive at the gospel. The gospel today is the following. Jesus is busy in his public life. He's busy preaching and teaching and casting out devils. <clears throat> but also Jesus is um, carrying out miracles. And the miracles of Jesus are of two kinds. Miracles over nature. Like the one they had the other day, Jesus was walking on the water. And then he multiplied the loaves and the fish. But then the other miracles of Jesus would be that of healing, especially the sick people. Because Jesus had great compassion on the sick. So today we have one of those healing miracles of Jesus. They show his great compassion and love for the suffering. And compassion means a willingness to suffer with others. Not only did Jesus suffer, but he, he actually suffered with others, and he suffers with us. We should learn the art of being able to suffer with others. That's called cum passio. It's a dimension of charity, a willingness to be able to suffer suffer with others. So Jesus is going from one town to another. And as he's traveling, 
A man approaches Jesus. And it's a man that is suffering incredibly. There's a man that was a leper. And basically the leprosy was all throughout the body of this man. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 5. And he says the man was full of leprosy. Remember that St. Luke, who's writing this gospel, is also a physician. He's a doctor. So this man, full of leprosy, seeing Jesus approach, normally lepers would have to maintain a distance. And according to the Mosaic law, they would have to cry out, impure. This protocol was broken. When you see this man drawn close to Christ, and it's interesting, the gesture that he does is a very interesting gesture. He's going to do the same thing that the kings did. You probably remember that the kings, upon seeing Jesus, they fell to the ground and they prostrated themselves. That means they fall to the ground with their forehead to the ground and their hands to the ground. They prostrate themselves and they opened up their coffers and they gave to Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now this leper is going to do the same thing. He prostrates himself on the ground And he's desperate. But he really trusts Jesus. And he pleads with Jesus saying, Lord, if you wish, you can make me clean. <clears throat> what a beautiful prayer. What a humble prayer. He didn't say, Lord, you have to make me clean. But he said, very humbly, Lord, if you wish, if you want, you can make me clean. It was a humble prayer, but he really trusted that Jesus was going to make him clean. Now, Jesus does a gesture now that is almost shocking. Don't forget that leprosy was one of the worst diseases in the time of Jesus. Talk about social distancing. Social distancing for the leper was much, much longer than six feet. So Jesus carries out a gesture that is shocking. And I think the people that surrounded Jesus would have, were shocked and afraid for Jesus. Because in Luke chapter, later on, Jesus is going to encounter ten lepers, and he's going to tell, go to the priest. He tells them to go, but he doesn't touch them. But this gospel, Jesus actually touches the leper. Which means he, he probably, because the leprosy was all over the man, Jesus probably actually touched, touched 
part of one of those open wounds or scabs. That, my friends, was unthinkable. People seeing this were probably shocked. Maybe some would think, oh no, now Jesus is going to become a leper too, and he's going to be isolated. They're going to place him maybe in a leper colony. Because leprosy was a highly contagious disease. And what happened was, Jesus touched him and said, I do will it. He says, I do will it. <clears throat> and he says, be made clean. Those two short sentences, I do will it be made clean. What happened? The leprosy left this man not gradually but it left him immediately you know when we go to doctors and even the best doctors our cures come about not always immediately sometimes it takes a lot of time a lot of effort a lot of medicine a lot of pills a lot of treatment sometimes operations and i'm not i'm not uh, speaking bad about doctors no thanks be to god we do have doctors especially now during this pandemic But here we see Jesus in the role of loving friend, of the Son of God. But also we see Jesus here as the divine physician. St. Luke was a physician, but Jesus was even a better physician. This man was healed immediately. Happened just like that. And I feel that this gospel is very important for us. Never in the history of the world have we gone through a situation as such. Not only the pandemic in the United States, it's all over the world. And it seems as if the second wave has hit Europe even more powerfully than us. A new strain of this coronavirus. Because before pandemics will maybe hit Europe, the Black Plague, but wouldn't be hitting other places at the same time. This is so widespread that it's a worldwide pandemic. You might even say that it's a, it's a worldwide leprosy. <clears throat> So part of your prayer today in your holy hour could be and should be to ask our Lord who is the divine physician to help our world, heal our world of this worldwide pandemic. 
Second is our country is going through a very difficult time. We all know it. Not only does our country have this pandemic of the coronavirus, but there's very much social and political unrest. As one of you mentioned in one of your comments, our country is broken. It's true. Our country is broken. So part of your holy hour and part of your prayer and part of your penance could be to ask our Lord, the divine physician, to heal the world, but also to heal our country of the many social political rules that there would be harmony. Let's try to pray for each other. Let's pray for the country. Pray that we'll be able to put into practice what Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. Living out the first and greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors ourselves. But last but not least is this. As we contemplating Jesus showing great compassion toward this leper, even touching this leper, and the power of Jesus emanated from him, the power of healing emanated from Christ. This man was healed. Worse than the pandemic, worse by the pandemic of the coronavirus is that of the coronavirus of sin. And as one of you put, stop the scourge of abortion, very true, very true. But let's start with ourselves. Let's start with ourselves as we do our holy hour. And be very humble. And recognize that this man that's full of leprosy <clears throat> This man is, is real, it's me, and it's you. There is physical leprosy, but there's spiritual leprosy. There's physical leprosy, but also there is spiritual leprosy. But good news, my friends, good news. There is a doctor in the house. There is a divine physician. The doctor in the house, the divine physician, my friends, is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's ask the Divine Physician, Jesus, to heal our world, to heal our country, to heal our family, but also to heal our own moral wounds. This could be our prayer. Lord, touch me and heal me of my own leprosy. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.